When Brenda Schaefer went missing, her family believed her ex-fiance was involved. The investigation went from Kentucky to Florida to Hong Kong, but eventually landed back where the family suspected. But the evidence they would need to prove it showed up too late. I'm Charlie and welcome to Crime Lines. Welcome to this week's episode. Just a quick reminder, I am going to be in Savannah very soon. September 25th, I will be at the Savannah Crime Expo. There are still tickets available. Please come, come say hi to me. But if you can't make it to the all-day event, which has a lot of great speakers, including Dr. Henry Lee, but if you can't make it, around 7.30, 8 o'clock, pretty much right when it wraps up, a bunch of us podcasters are going to Moon River. I think it's Brewing Company. Anyway, Moon River in Savannah, Georgia. That's where we're going to be just to have dinner, have a drink, say hi to people. So if you can't make it to the all-day event, please come on the 25th, 730, 8 o'clock, whenever we get ourselves down there for a very casual meetup. So it's going to be Kelly from True Crime IRL, Bob Mata from The Defense Diaries, Josh Hallmark from True Crime BS, and Nina from Already Gone. And I want to say Colts and Cabernets. I don't have the information in front of me, obviously. I'm just trying to remember everything. But there's going to be a bunch of us there, so please come say hi. So let's get into this week's episode. It was suggested by Michelle, and as soon as I read the blurb on it, I knew we needed to talk about this one, so thank you so much for sending it in. Case suggestions are best sent to crimelinespodcast at gmail.com to make sure they make it to my suggestion list. So this case is pretty straightforward at first, but then the twists start, and it's kind of a long episode, but I'm not going to split it into two parts, so let's just get going with it. So let's start with Brenda Sue Schaefer. She grew up in the Louisville area, and when she was in her second year of high school, she met a man named Pete Van Pelt, a man, young man. (laughs) He was probably not much older than her. They dated through her high school years, and he would be her only high school boyfriend. They planned on getting married as soon as she graduated in 1971, But they ended up delaying the wedding until later in the year when, in May 1971, Brenda's brother died. Pete would say that the marriage fell apart because they were too young, which was not untrue. But to be a bit more specific than that, there were serious financial issues. They made well below the median income for the time, and according to Brenda's family, Pete was irresponsible, immature the way young people are, with how they spent their money. And he would buy things they couldn't afford, which just added more stress to the young couple. Within three years, Brenda knew they were heading towards divorce, which was something that had her deeply conflicted as a Catholic. She turned to her parents for advice, and her father essentially said, well, Brenda made her choice to get married, so it was her job to stay and work it out. But as the final year of the marriage remained rocky, Brenda's mother eventually talked him into having Brenda move back home while she did divorce Pete. The divorce was final in 1976. It took a while for Brenda to recover from the end of her marriage. She felt like a failure. And she had wrapped up her self-esteem with Pete and her relationship with him since she was 15 years old. So the bottom really fell out for her when the marriage ended. But she picked herself back up. She bought a condo and met a man named Jim Rush. Jim was a dentist. He was really successful in his job. He was all the things that her first husband was not, and he really loved Brenda. He wasn't shy about showing it. As someone who wrapped her self-worth up in her relationships, this did build Brenda up a little bit. The two ended up staying together for eight years, and Jim wanted to get married, and Brenda wanted to marry him, except Jim drank more than Brenda was comfortable with. She couldn't see a life with someone who drank to excess, but she also didn't want to break things off because she did truly love him. Brenda also had another issue. She had complicated views around sex, and it affected their sex life. 
It was later discovered that Brenda had a hysterectomy at some point and had complained to friends about her cycles being painful. So we're going to have a quick women's health lesson for those who need it. The same conditions that can cause severe menstrual cycle symptoms can also cause pain during sex. Fibroids, PCOS, and endometriosis are three conditions off the top of my head that do this. So it may not just be that Brenda had hang-ups about sex. Physical pain could have been compounding that. At the end of the relationship with Jim, after going back and forth about breaking up for a while, Jim was ready to confront the issues directly. He wrote Brenda a letter outlining the troubles in their relationship, which included their sexual problems. That letter and confronting the issues was too much for Brenda to take on, and they ended things once and for all. Brenda's best friend Joyce saw her heartbreak and knew what she needed to get over Jim. She needed to get back out in the dating world. And Joyce was dating a well-to-do older man who had friends who were also well-to-do somewhat older men. So Joyce set Brenda up with her boyfriend's friend, Mel Ignato. This was September 1986. Brenda was 34 and Mel was 48. The two couples did a double date together. They had dinner on Mel's boat. Mel was a divorced businessman. He had three kids. While he did have custody of his kids after the divorce, by this point, they were older. His youngest child, a son, was a teenager. Mel said at one point that his relationship with Brenda progressed slowly at first, but he also said they were engaged in February 1987, five months after their first date. I am no relationship expert, but five months from blind date to engagement does not sound slow to me. What does sound slow to me was engagement to planning the wedding, which is something that actually never happened. Things absolutely slowed down after the proposal, with Brenda hesitating to set a wedding date. She did have a lot of other things going on in her life. Brenda worked full-time, and she helped care for her mother when she wasn't at work. Brenda even ended up moving back with her parents so she could help out more. Her mother, Essie, was recovering from a stroke on top of having heart problems, on top of having lupus. Brenda was devoted to her parents and to Essie in particular. Brenda was the youngest of six kids, and Essie absolutely babied her. And it wasn't just because Brenda was the youngest, but Brenda was born after her mother experienced a traumatic stillbirth. Not that any stillbirth is not traumatic, but this was a particularly difficult situation, and that added to the protectiveness Essie felt towards her new baby. That bond lasted well into Brenda's adult years, so when her mother needed a caretaker, Brenda was right there to help. So with a busy life, Mel and Brenda would see each other on the weekends only, It's honestly not even clear why she accepted Mel's marriage proposal because she did confide in her friends that she had doubts surrounding the relationship pretty much from the start. So if I'm being blunt, to me, it sounds like Brenda was settling. She was done with dating. She was done with the single life. She wanted to settle down and have some stability Mel treated her well, at first at least. He showed a genuine interest in her and what she had to say. And he could provide for her financially. She wasn't unhappy with him for several months of their relationship, though she wasn't exactly elated either. Like I said before, she was someone who wrapped a lot of her sense of self in her relationship. So you have to imagine that this was difficult on her. So in spite of being engaged five months into the relationship, it didn't progress much after that. And Brenda began to see a different side to Mel, a side that tried to violate her boundaries and a side that grew more controlling. So let's fast forward to December 1987. They had been dating for about 15 months, and Mel decided to move to Florida. He wanted to get into the real estate market down there. 
Brenda planned to join him and even put in notice at her job where she had worked most of her adult life. But her family and friends noticed Brenda was not excited about moving. Moving from your hometown is always bittersweet. You are excited for your new prospects and what's ahead of you, but you also know you're going to miss your home. But Brenda didn't seem to have any of the sweet part of the bittersweet, just the bitter part. She would tense up whenever the move was brought up, and it was pretty clear to everyone that she didn't want to go. In the end, Brenda never did move to Florida. Why exactly depends who you ask and when you ask them, it seems. According to Mel, at least at one point, he and Brenda realized that Essie needed her too much and they didn't want her to leave her mother behind when Brenda was so needed. So instead, Mel decided to move back to Kentucky so that they can stay together and Brenda wouldn't have to move. But other sources seem to indicate that Mel's business plans didn't work out in Florida. He actually returned to Kentucky because of that, and he did so before Brenda ever made the move to Florida. And when the move was called off, Brenda's work let her go ahead and keep her position, even though she had given her notice, and things just continued as they had been. But this almost move may have been a bit of a realization for Brenda that her relationship with Mel was absolutely not what she wanted. One issue Brenda had with Mel was the boundary issue that I touched on earlier. According to what Brenda told a friend, Mel had sexual fantasies that Brenda was not interested in, and he actually made her uncomfortable when he would continuously bring them up. So I've mentioned that Brenda had some hangups about sex that she was working through in a previous relationship, things that had not been fully resolved. And also she had physical issues. But I do want to be clear here. Just because someone does not want to do something, it doesn't mean it's automatically a hang-up. It can be a boundary. Brenda could have hang-ups that she wanted to work through for sure, while still having boundaries that were going to be there even if the shame, the insecurities, whatever was fueling her hangups, even if that was completely healed, she would still have boundaries. We all have boundaries. Her ex-boyfriend, Jim, felt that Brenda's hangups were interfering with their intimacy. That is not the same thing as Mel trying to violate Brenda's boundaries by trying to pressure her into things like group sex, things she just did not want to do. And when Mel didn't respect Brenda's boundaries on this, it made her wonder how safe she was with him. There was another thing coworkers noticed with Mel, and that was the controlling aspect. He would call Brenda at work two or three times a day. And when Mel would be out of town on a business trip, he would draw up a schedule of when he would call Brenda while he was gone, and Brenda was expected to immediately pick up the phone and never miss a call. This schedule wasn't because Mel loved to talk to Brenda and wanted to make sure they didn't miss a chance to talk. It wasn't even to check up on her to make sure she was at work when she was supposed to be because Brenda was always at work when she was scheduled to be there. This act was control for the sake of control. It's, I told you to answer the phone at 11 and 2, and you will answer the phone at 11 and 2. It was about control, and Brenda did, in fact, answer the phone. Mel also started demanding more of Brenda's time. When they got engaged early on, Mel seemed okay with their weekends only dating life. But that gave way to him wanting her to spend all of her time with him. He yelled at her once for being too social with other people. As more people in Brenda's life were picking up on these controlling behaviors, they encouraged Brenda to break things off with Mel. And she did try a few times. Mel would generally blame Brenda for the issues in the relationship, and at her low points, Brenda believed him. 
In my opinion, Mel leveraged Brenda's low self-confidence to convince her she was better off with him than without him, and if only she could change and do better, they could be together. The two continued dating for several more months into 1988 until about the summertime. Brenda began acting moody and withdrawn around her family and friends. She was making mistakes at work, things she wouldn't normally mess up on, all because she was very distracted. While Brenda would not give much about specifics, she did say she was ready to end things with Mel for good. She wanted, however, to let him down gently. Was that because she hated conflict and didn't feel strong enough to stand against his emotional response? Maybe. Was it because she was actually scared of Mel? Possibly. Whatever the reason, she did not want to break things off suddenly. She wanted to sort of let things fade out. Towards late summer, Brenda was in contact with her ex, Jim Rush, and they were talking about getting back together. But she had to finish this slow process of breaking up with Mel. On Wednesday, September 21st, 1988, Brenda told Jim and her coworkers that she had finally broken things off with Mel. She did have to see him one more time to return some of the items he gave her, like the engagement ring. She made plans to see him on Saturday. The day before this, Mel called Brenda at work and she told him, that she had said, do not call her anymore, and hung up on him. The next day, the Saturday, which was the 24th, Brenda left her parents' house to go to Mel's house. It was around 3 p.m. They were under the impression she would be back later in the evening after she returned the jewelry and said whatever final goodbye they had to say. Essie suggested to Brenda that instead she have Mel over to their house because he's not going to make a scene in front of the family and make it harder on Brenda. But she said she would just go to his house, it was about 15 minutes away, and be done with it. Essie and Brenda's father, John, stayed up waiting for her to return. At 3.30 in the morning, Essie called Mel's house looking for Brenda, and Mel said she actually left hours before, around 11.30. Less than a half hour later, Mel called back to see if Brenda had made it home yet. Essie said yes, she had. According to Essie, Mel didn't sound like he quite believed her and said something like, are you sure? Essie said, yep, and hung up. The truth was, Brenda had not made it home. After calling Mel and realizing Brenda wasn't there, Essie thought of where else she could be overnight. It seemed possible, maybe even likely, that Brenda left Mel's house after breaking up with him and went straight to Jim's place, since they were in the process of reconciling. Not wanting to cause drama for Brenda with Mel, Essie basically was covering for her and lied about her being home. But Brenda wasn't home, and it turned out she wasn't with Jim either when they checked with him. So around 4 a.m., Brenda's father, John, called the police to report her missing. About 15 minutes after that, Mel also called the police to report Brenda missing, even though Essie had told him she was at home. The family then gathered together at John and Essie's house to wait for news about Brenda, and at some point, Mel joined them. Just two hours after Brenda was reported missing, a patrol officer spotted her car on the westbound side of I-64. The car, a 1984 Buick Regal, had a flat tire. A closer inspection of the tire showed that there was a nail in it. There were also signs of a robbery. A rear window had been broken and the radio was gone. Papers were scattered as though someone had ransacked the car. And someone tried to remove the speakers and also tried to pry the trunk open. Where the car was found was on the way Brenda would have driven from Mel's home to her home, that 15-minute drive. 
Mel told the family and the police that she had left his place at 1130, and the car did appear to have been on the side of the highway for a while. There was dew on it, and the engine was cold. Now, had a thief approached the car while Brenda was still in it, and that thief was responsible for her disappearance, that person would not have needed to break a window or pry the trunk open to get items. It actually looked like the break-in of the car happened after the car was abandoned on the side of the highway. It was not part of whatever caused Brenda's disappearance. There was some blood in the back of the car and outside of the car, so it looked possible that Brenda had a flat tire, she pulled over, and someone had abducted her from the scene, possibly pulling over under the guise of helping. But Brenda's family did not think this. They were back home already side-eyeing Mel that entire morning after he had shown up at their house. Mel carried on sobbing all morning, and he was told repeatedly he needed to calm down and have some hope. It had only been a few hours. Mel told everyone that he just knew Brenda was dead, and he just kept loudly weeping. Eventually, the family told him to knock it off, because all he was doing was making Brenda's mother more and more upset. After watching this production, two people at the house, Brenda's brother and his girlfriend, spoke to each other quietly and decided they were going to go to the police department, away from the rest of the family and away from Mel, to tell the police all they knew about Mel and his relationship with Brenda. The brother's girlfriend, her name was Linda, she was a very good friend of Brenda's, so Brenda confided quite a bit in her. Linda told the police that Mel had been abusive, and she gave some specific examples. One story she told happened when Brenda and Mel were on vacation not too long before the breakup. Brenda told Linda that she was lying in bed, asleep, at the hotel, when she woke up to something covering her mouth and a weird smell. She pushed it off of her face, and it was Mel standing there. He had put some type of rag over her mouth. Brenda asked what he was doing, and he said he wanted to help her relax and be able to sleep. This made little sense because she was already asleep. On the rag was chloroform, which Mel claimed he used as a sleep aid on himself. But like I said, Brenda was already asleep. Why did he want to sedate her further? Alarm bells were going off, so Brenda started to pack her bag to head home while Mel begged her to stay. Brenda ended up staying, not because she wanted to exactly, but because she had no way to get home. They were out of town on vacation. Brenda later told her mother about this incident as well, so we have two people who heard about it. Obviously, the police hearing this means they want to talk to Mel, but he was someone they wanted to talk to anyway. He was the last one to see Brenda, and she had recently broken up with him. And now they know Mel had also been controlling and downright scary in their relationship. When the police initially questioned Mel, he cried a lot. They had to get him to calm down just to give the basic movements of the day Brenda went missing. Mel said that afternoon, the two went out driving. He claimed he had issues with his own car's tires, so that's why they took her car. But whatever problem he had with his car was magically healed on Sunday morning when he drove it over to Brenda's parents' house. Anyway, Mel and Brenda initially had plans to go to an art fair, and it rained, so they changed their plans. They drove around talking, they went to dinner, they went to a few different places before Brenda dropped him off at his house around 11.30. Then she drove off. As for Mel's alibi after that point, he said he was hungry, so he went to the nearby Skyline Chili around midnight for that very unique delicacy of Cincinnati-style chili served over spaghetti. No word on if he ordered it three-way, four-way, or five. 
One assistant manager at the Skyline remembered seeing Mel there, but the manager didn't, so it's not exactly confirmed. Mel said after that he went home and he was there until he got the call from Essie around 3.30 in the morning, and that is his first sign that anything was wrong with Brenda. Mel said he was actually surprised to hear from Essie. Brenda would regularly be out very late, and her family never called around looking for her. Essie being alarmed was part of what alarmed him. Mel told the police that, in his opinion, they needed to look more closely at Pete, who was Brenda's ex-husband. They had been divorced nearly 15 years at this point, and they also needed to look at her ex-boyfriend, Jim. Mel also said that he and Brenda hadn't actually broken up. He didn't know why everyone else seemed to think they had. The whole point of going over there, according to Brenda's family, was to give him back his jewelry. But according to Mel, they didn't break up and he never got the jewelry. It was not found during searches of her car, her house, or Mel's house. The jewelry was missing along with Brenda. So those are essentially the important parts about what Mel said to the police. What he also did was pepper them with questions, something he did throughout the investigation. Anytime they went to talk to him, he seemed to have more questions for them than they had for him. He wanted to know everything about the investigation. On Monday, Brenda did not show up for work, a job she had held for 12 years without ever pulling a no-call, no-show situation. Any hope she was just staying away, maybe getting some space from everyone, was gone at this point. The police did go to the office to talk to her boss and her various co-workers. Her boss was a dentist named Dr. William Spaulding. The co-workers told more about the controlling behavior from Mel, including the multiple calls to Brenda's job nearly every day. They also heard another disturbing story that, with the vacation story, really seems like a pattern was forming. Brenda told a coworker that one night, Mel gave her some pills to take. The pills completely knocked her out, and when she woke up hours later, she was completely nude and had no idea what had happened. It's not clear in the timeline if this happened before or after he put the chloroform to her face on vacation. The investigators then talked to Joyce, Brenda's friend who introduced her to Mel. Her information was not much different than what they had already heard, but Joyce suggested they talk to a woman named Mary Ann Shore. Mel had first met Mary Ann when he hired her for child care. He had gotten custody of his kids in his divorce, and Mary Ann would watch them while he worked. Frankly, his kids did not like her. She wouldn't really care for them very well, but would manipulate them into telling Mel differently. Mary Ann was interested in dating Mel, which the two eventually ended up doing. They split in 1984, according to Marianne, because she realized that Mel was never going to marry her. But they did continue sleeping together. That was regardless of if Mel was in a relationship or not. The two seemed to have some type of codependency on each other that neither could quite shake. Joyce thought Marianne might have some insight into things with Mel. But when she talked to the police, Marianne said she actually hadn't even seen Mel in the six months leading up to Brenda's disappearance. She also said she didn't know Mel to be possessive, abusive, or violent in a relationship. That would be quite remarkable because when investigators talked to other people Mel had relationships with, like his ex-wife, they heard more about abusive behavior. So Mel was abusive in his relationships immediately before and immediately after his relationship with Marianne, but he was an angel to her and her alone. No one was buying Marianne's story. For investigators, though, it was more than her insistence Mel was a great guy when everyone else said he wasn't. It was her overall demeanor when they spoke to her. I know that's subjective. But the investigators got the impression that Marianne was hiding something, and that made them focus on her more. 
Not that this was the only interview they were focusing on. They did a lot of interviews in the early days. Family, friends, coworkers, Mel, Marianne, the Skyline Chili manager. Everyone was interviewed, but no one knew where Brenda was or what happened to her. The search of the area where her car was found in the Ohio River didn't give any more evidence of where Brenda went. The nail on her car tire stood out to the investigators when they looked at it closely because it didn't show any signs of contact with the road. Friction marks would have been formed on the head of the nail if the car had picked up the nail and the tire went a few rotations before Brenda pulled over. There were no signs of that. To the investigators, it looked like the nail may have been pushed into the tire, which means someone staged the flat tire. Now, that doesn't tell us what did happen to Brenda Schaefer, but it does say that it is possible that whatever happened to her did not occur on the side of the road. The car may have been dumped by the killer who stuck a nail in it to stage a flat tire. What it also did was open up the possibility that Mel was responsible. He was with Brenda until 3.30 until he was most likely seen at the Skyline Chili Place close to midnight. That is a wide window for something to have happened, and his entire alibi for that window is that he was with the person who disappeared. Believing that the key to finding Brenda was with Mel, the police had Brenda's brother, Tom, wear a wire and go talk with Mel. Over the course of a few weeks, the two met multiple times, but Mel never confessed or gave any clue what happened. He continued to blame Brenda's exes and even brought up some mysterious enemies she had at work, enemies no one else had ever heard of. Eventually, Tom called off these meetups with Mel. They weren't going anywhere, and that was frustrating to him. But the straw that broke the camel's back was when Mel showed up with a list of Brenda's belongings, and he started talking about how to divide them up. And then he said if the jewelry he had given Brenda was ever found, he wanted it back. He even made some noise about making an insurance claim for the jewelry. Tom thought Mel was responsible for whatever happened to his sister, and this was just too much. He was done humoring Mel in the hopes of getting some type of information. In mid-October, while Tom was still doing these meetings with Mel and Brenda had been missing for about a month, a press conference was held. Tom spoke and brought up that this was actually the second major tragedy the family had experienced. I mentioned before that Brenda postponed her wedding due to her brother's death. This was her brother, John, and he was shot and killed in the line of duty. It was about 10 p.m. in Louisville on May 2nd, 1971, when John Schaefer and his partner, Wilbur Hayes, attempted to arrest two men for a theft at a roofing company. One of the men pulled a gun and fired. Both John and his partner, Wilbur, were shot and killed. John had only been with the police department for 18 months. The two men, brothers William and Narville Tinsley, were arrested. They both got death sentences, but those were commuted to life in prison when the Supreme Court put a moratorium on the death penalty. Then, on September 16, 1988, just eight days before Brenda went missing, The Tinsleys were paroled after 17 years in prison. William was released into the community. Narvel was also paroled, but he was looking to relocate to another state, so he was in some type of transitional housing. Brenda went missing just over a week after her brother's killers were released from prison. This seemed like too shocking of a coincidence and the Tinsley brothers had to be investigated. They were cleared from involvement, and the timing really was a coincidence. More than a coincidence, it was an awful one-two punch for the Schaefer family. 
Like with the Tinsleys, the investigators kept hitting dead ends with every person of interest they looked into, with the exception of Mel Ignato. They followed leads in Miami and Hong Kong after tips came in saying that Mel was involved in drug dealing in Florida. He was involved in sex crimes in Southeast Asia. But all of these leads didn't pan out either. Mel had his own idea of how he could help the authorities find Brenda. He asked the family if he could have access to her bedroom. He thought if he went in there, he could pick up psychic vibrations that would let him know where she was. The family told the FBI about this request, and they said, yeah, let him do that, but let us hook up some cameras first. They were going to watch him. They thought maybe Mel was trying to return or plant some items, maybe even the missing jewelry or her purse. Those items had not been found at Mel's house, which did give some support to his claim that Brenda left his house alive and well. Perhaps they were stolen from the car by the same person who took the radio. But what if those items were found in Brenda's room all of the sudden? Then it would change the timeline completely. It would look like she made it home from Mel's house, which would prove he didn't do anything. So Mel was given access to the bedroom, and he did pretty much nothing. He just hung out in there for a while. I guess he picked up on some vibrations. Or maybe it's possible he was going to plant some evidence or look for something in the room, but it occurred to him that he was probably being monitored. So yet another promising lead that didn't go anywhere. I can only imagine how frustrating cases like this are. The answer seems to be right in front of you, but you can't prove it. One person in Brenda's life decided to try to spark some movement in the case and prove what he believed. In March of 1989, six months after Brenda's disappearance, Mel went to the police with a threatening letter he had received. The letter demanded that he give the information on where Brenda's body was, or a gang of Cubans would execute him. It was signed, A Family Friend Returning a Favor. The postmark was from Miami, but the investigators knew immediately who had sent it. It was Dr. William Spaulding, Brenda's boss. He had previously told the police that he wanted to send a letter just like this, and scare Mel into giving up the location of Brenda's body. The detectives told him they appreciated his enthusiasm, but let's not do something like that. Dr. Spaulding said, okay, and then he did it anyway. He had sent the letter to a friend in Miami to then mail it to Mel. The police basically told Mel to just ignore the letter and move on. They didn't want to charge someone who clearly did this out of emotional desperation. Dr. Spaulding was a 60-something-year-old dentist in Kentucky. He didn't have connections to Miami-based gangs. This was an empty threat. But Mel was incensed that they were not going to charge Dr. Spaulding for threatening him, so he went and took out a warrant on his own. This case did go to trial, and the trial made it clear that Mel Ignato was the prime and only suspect in Brenda's disappearance. Even the investigators seemed to defend Dr. Spaulding from the stand, though Mel testified the threat scared him so much that he had a heart attack three days after receiving it and had to be admitted into the hospital. Dr. Spaulding was found guilty of misdemeanor terroristic threatening, and he was fined $300. For all of Dr. Spaulding's good intentions, this attempt did not move the case forward at all. A year after Brenda went missing, a federal grand jury was formed to look into the evidence. In October 1989, Mel decided he wanted to testify in front of that grand jury. Targets of investigations do not usually testify at the grand jury. They have a Fifth Amendment right to avoid implicating themselves. But Mel said he saw this as a chance to clear his name after the media had pretty much tried and convicted him already. 
Mel's attorney tried to talk him out of it like any good attorney would, but when Mel wouldn't listen, he realized the best he could do was prep his client for the questions he could expect. On October 16th, 1989, Mel testified for four hours. Grand jury testimony is sealed, but we do know some of what Mel said because it would come up in another case, and we are going to get to that later. Here are the important things he testified to. Mel was asked about the chloroform incident that Brenda told her mother and her friend about. Mel's response was basically that it happened, but it had been taken out of context. According to Mel, there's some kind of context to explain putting a rag of chloroform on someone's face. Mel said he did give Brenda a tissue with chloroform on it. He used chloroform himself at night when his nose would get stuffy from allergies, and if Brenda had a similar issue or trouble sleeping, he would also give it to her if needed. He was asked if he ever put the tissue on Brenda's face himself versus handing it to her and letting her do it, and Mel said no. They used the cloths individually on themselves, but then he followed it up with, But I mean, you know how you'll get playful sometimes. So his context for putting a rag of chloroform on Brenda's face was that he was being playful. That's his defense. Mel was visibly uncomfortable when the conversation was talking about the chloroform, and he regained his composure when they moved on from it. But that squirming was about all Mel did. He answered the rest of the questions without getting the least bit flustered, and he confessed to absolutely nothing. He was asked about his relationship with Marianne Shore, his ex-girlfriend, and specifically if he had any type of relationship with her after Brenda's disappearance. He said he did, but it wasn't until months afterwards, and it didn't last long. He said Marianne and Brenda had never met and the relationships did not overlap. He denied ever hurting Brenda or being involved in her disappearance. Marianne was also called to testify. Mel had said that Marianne and Brenda had never met, but Marianne testified that she had actually met Brenda once. Later in her testimony, Marianne was asked something about Brenda's appearance, and Marianne tried to get clarification on what they meant by asking, you mean the last time I saw her? So if Marianne had only seen Brenda one time, why would she need clarification to see if they meant the last time she saw Brenda or some other time? The first and last time would have been the same if she had only met her once. The contradiction was immediately pointed out to Marianne and reportedly she refused to answer any more questions and it left the grand jury room. I think the word used in the reporting is she fled the grand jury room. Though the grand jury ultimately did not come back with an indictment at that time, the investigators got what they needed out of the testimony. They had caught Marianne in a lie, and they knew there was more she hadn't said yet. So they began investigating her more closely, learning from people around her that she was obsessed with Mel. Their relationship did overlap with the time he was seeing Brenda and when he was seeing other people, too. Witnesses said Marianne would do anything for Mel's attention, and he would use that to manipulate her over the years. The investigators also kept talking to Marianne whenever they had a reason to question her, and they even had her consent to a polygraph, which she reportedly failed. They hoped with enough pressure, Marianne would come clean. And they were able to apply even more pressure to Marianne in January 1990. This was about 16 months after the disappearance and three months after Marianne's disastrous grand jury testimony. Marianne was arrested for passing bad checks. Already starting to buckle under the attention surrounding Brenda's case and now facing jail time for those checks, Marianne said, She was ready to talk, but only with her attorney present. She was willing to tell the investigators everything she knew, 
but there was going to be a deal attached. We'll get to the deal in a minute. Let's cover what Marianne said happened to Brenda Schaefer. Marianne confessed that she did have some involvement. She had been recruited in this by Mel. He was the cause of Brenda's disappearance, and he had planned it in advance. He told Marianne that he needed her help to put Brenda through some sort of sex therapy to get over her sexual hangups. He then gave Marianne a list of things she needed to get for him, which included rope and duct tape. On the Saturday, Brenda showed up at Mel's house to return the jewelry. Mel had some sort of ruse to get her to go with him to Marianne's house. Once at Marianne's house, Brenda sat on the couch, but she soon realized things were not okay and she was not safe. She got up to leave and was forced back down. Mel then tied Brenda to the coffee table and he raped her. He physically abused her with Marianne right there. He then forced Brenda into Marianne's bedroom. He told Marianne to leave the room, which she did. When Mel came out of the bedroom sometime later, he told Marianne that Brenda was dead. He had killed her with chloroform. The two then wrapped Brenda's body in a garbage bag and buried her in a hole in Marianne's backyard. It was a hole that Mel had dug up to two weeks prior to the murder. That's how planned this was. Mel had dug a grave weeks before. Days before, Marianne said they scream tested her house. Mel stood outside while Marianne screamed on the top of her lungs inside. He wanted to know what, if anything, neighbors would hear while Brenda was being tortured. Something else Marianne said was that Mel told her not to just watch what happened, but actually to take pictures of his abuse towards Brenda. She didn't know where the pictures were because Mel took the film with him, but she said Brenda was clearly visible in these photographs, though Mel instructed her to make sure that his face was out of frame. Though Marianne could not help the police locate the photographs, she could lead them to the spot in the backyard where Brenda's body was. Marianne no longer lived at the house, but she did take them out there, and they marked the area ready to come back later with a search warrant to dig. While they waited on that, they told Marianne she needed to talk to Mel while they listened in to see if he would implicate himself. Marianne didn't have much of a choice here because she had just confessed to a number of crimes herself. Even though she denied she knew Brenda was going to be murdered and she wasn't in the room when it happened, she definitely participated in everything right up to the murder and then everything right after. But they were offering her a deal where she would only have to plead guilty to tampering with evidence. The conditions were that she had to cooperate fully, which included leading them to Brenda's body, trying to get Mel to implicate himself on tape, and if it came to it, testifying against Mel in court. So they wired up Marianne's apartment for sound while agents were going to hide in the closet, and Marianne then called Mel and invited him over. Mel refused. He knew they had been looking closely at Marianne, and he was convinced her phone was bugged and her house was bugged. But he was also confident of his control over her, so it didn't occur to him that these things were bugged, but with her consent and knowledge. So he agreed to meet up with Marianne in a parking lot of an ice cream shop to talk. The authorities had to quickly refocus their surveillance and get Marianne to wear the wire, which was definitely riskier for Marianne. It can also lead to a less clear recording, particularly in the early 1990s. They were definitely not going to get as crisp and clear of a confession from Mel when the microphone was hidden under someone's clothing. But this is what they could do, so they did it. Marianne drove to the parking lot, got out of her car, and then sat in Mel's car while they talked. 
The plan was to get Mel to make references, specific ones, to Brenda's murder. But Mel, knowing he was the prime suspect, kept skating along the edge. Marianne told him that she was worried because the property she lived on had been sold to new owners and she was afraid they would dig. Mel told her not to get rattled and that place we dug is not shallow. Marianne said she was asked to take a polygraph and her lawyer told her she should go ahead and take it and Mel told her not to and that she needed to stop cooperating with the authorities. He encouraged her on what she should say and should not say. But in that 13-minute conversation, Mel never mentioned Brenda. He basically just told Marianne to relax and he would handle it if push came to shove, but he was not worried. This recording was a complete disappointment. Not only did Mel not really incriminate himself that much, the microphone was muffled. So even the most incriminating things he said, like referencing a place they dug not being shallow, that wasn't 100% clear what he said. And he certainly didn't confess to why he dug any place in her yard. The investigators had hoped that Mel would say something wildly incriminating and they could swoop in and arrest him on the spot, but now, with him not doing that, they needed more evidence. They let Mel leave and everyone reconvened at Marianne's apartment. She ended up going into even more detail on what happened with Brenda and showed the police the bed in her apartment. It was the same one she said Mel killed Brenda on. She hadn't even replaced the mattress afterwards. Marianne Shore was sleeping on the murder mattress for a year and a half at this point. But there wasn't a lot of evidence on it. According to what Mel had told to Marianne, he killed Brenda with chloroform. So there wasn't major blood evidence to collect to prove the story. Without the confession on tape or forensic evidence, they needed Brenda's body before they could arrest Mel. As soon as the search warrant was in hand, around 10 p.m., they drove out to the property to dig. Because it was dark, they had to bring in lights. They weren't too worried about tipping people off because Marianne told them exactly where to dig, so it probably wouldn't take long. Except they dug where she told them to dig, and there was no body. Marianne was either lying or she just misremembered the exact spot. The investigators did not think she was lying. They were confident Brenda was back there, but they would have to wait to find her until the following day when they could get a cadaver dog to the property. So now they were worried about tipping Mel off. If he heard about this digging or drove by and saw it himself, he might go on the run. So they took a leap of faith that Brenda's body was on that property and would be found soon. At 2 a.m., an arrest warrant for Mel Ignato was issued. At 2.30, he was in handcuffs and being led away from his apartment. The next day, they returned to the property with the cadaver dog, a German shepherd named Bingo. Their trust in Marianne paid off. Bingo quickly found the spot, and 36-year-old Brenda Schaefer's body was found just as Marianne had described it, tied up in a garbage bag in the backyard. The autopsy on Brenda's remains did not reveal much. Decomposition had taken most of the physical evidence with it, including the cause of death. The official ruling was death by homicide of non-determined means. They had pretty much no forensic evidence tying Mel to the murder. They didn't have a confession. Brenda's body wasn't even found on Mel's property, but rather someone else's. What they had was Marianne Shore's word that it was Mel who killed Brenda. They wanted more than that. Detailed searches of every property Mel so much as looked at were done in the hopes of finding the photographs Marianne described. That would be the slam dunk evidence. Though Marianne was known for being a less than honest person overall, the investigators really did believe her that those photographs existed. Why else would she mention them? 
their existence certainly didn't help her in any way. They showed she was involved in what happened and not just a shrinking violet in the corner. These photographs could persuade a judge to give her the maximum sentence allowed in the plea deal. Marianne really had no reason to lie about the existence of this film, but the police could never find it. Even so, the case was going ahead. Mel was charged with murder, kidnapping, sodomy, sexual abuse, robbery, and tampering with evidence. Marianne Shore was indicted just on that charge of tampering with evidence in line with the deal she made. The case had so much publicity before and after Mel's arrest that there was a motion to move the trial, which is not uncommon. Every pretrial motion has the potential to delay the actual trial. However, things ended up becoming more delayed than normal when Marianne developed Bell's palsy, a condition that causes partial facial paralysis. Marianne showed up in court for one of these many pretrial hearings that she needed to be at, but her speech was unintelligible during her testimony. She did have a doctor's note confirming the condition, though there were some questions about if Bell's palsy could cause such a severe speech issue or if Marianne was malingering. Regardless, the pretrial hearings were delayed because Marianne's speech, whether she was faking it or not, could not be understood. And in these delays from arrest to trial, Brenda's parents both died. Her mother died in July 1990 and her father in February 1991. It wasn't until May 1991 that Marianne's condition had cleared up enough for her to participate in the pretrial hearings and everything started to move forward again. Mel's trial was moved to a different county and began in December 1991. Days before it started, Marianne pleaded guilty to tampering with evidence, but they delayed sentencing until after Mel's trial so that she could testify. The state was in a bit of a situation with Mary Ann Shore's testimony. She was the star witness. She tied the case together. But she was also someone who admitted to participating in some of the abuse against Brenda. She was someone with an arrest record that included fraud charges, and fraud at the core is deception. They had to sell Mary Ann somehow as less culpable than she actually was, and more credible than the evidence supported. So in the opening statement, the prosecutor said that Marianne did not know a murder was going to take place that night. She only knew that Mel was bringing Brenda over and that the plan was to scare her, not kill her. Never mind Marianne knew about the grave being dug weeks in advance. That's a minor detail. Let's pretend it never happened. Now, for the defense, they, of course, worked the other way. There was no physical evidence linking Mel to the murder. It was just Marianne who linked him to the murder, a woman who was obsessed with Mel, jealous over the younger and more attractive Brenda Schaefer, and a known liar who cut a sweetheart deal. Wouldn't she be the more likely suspect? She could kill the rival— and then when it came down to it, pin it on Mel, which was going to send him to death row. The defense didn't only point to Marianne, though she was the obvious alternative suspect. They also brought up Dr. Spaulding, Brenda's boss, who sent that threatening letter to Mel. Instead of portraying his affection for Brenda in its accurate context, which was paternal, they twisted it to make it seem like he was the possessive one. According to the defense, there was just too little evidence to say who killed Brenda, and therefore Mel should be acquitted because there was reasonable doubt. It seemed a lot of the case rode on how Marianne held up on the stand and if the jury believed her. And let's be honest, she did not do well. She came across as distant as she recounted events that should have traumatized her. And maybe they did, and that is how her brain coped with what she participated in. But that is not what it looked like to the jury, particularly when Marianne would also occasionally laugh during her testimony. 
We know paradoxical laughing, which is when you laugh at external things that aren't actually funny, can be a sign of an altered mental state, as can being cold and distant. But it doesn't really matter what my Psychology 101 textbook says about these things. It's what the jury interprets that counts. Marianne also made an unfortunate choice in dress for her testimony. These things should not be a big deal, but... In this instance, Marianne wore a miniskirt. Not that that is a huge deal, except the witness stand was up a little bit higher than the rest of the courtroom. So when she's sitting in an elevated position, she showed more than she intended. So in addition to coming off as cold and detached, she also came across as inappropriate. Another issue the state had with this case was that the judge excluded a bunch of testimony about Brenda and Mel's relationship. The pattern of control and abuse led to the motive. Mel would rather kill Brenda than let her break up with him. But most of the witnesses hadn't actually witnessed anything. They only heard Brenda's side of what happened. This was not firsthand information. This type of testimony is sometimes allowed to be presented in court. Generally, though, there needs to be some kind of corroboration. It is at the discretion of the judge, as is much of what is allowed in court. That's actually the judge's job. This judge said no to this testimony and excluded anything that was not witnessed firsthand. Brenda's best friend was able to testify to what she saw and heard herself, but the bulk of what we talked about in this episode was not heard by the jury because all the witnesses could say is, Brenda told me that Mel said this. Even excluding all of those witnesses, this trial did last for three weeks, and the jury deliberated for six hours. Then they came back with a verdict of not guilty against Mel Ignato. They agreed with the defense that there was reasonable doubt, in part because they believed the police had tunnel vision in investigating Mel, and they didn't branch out enough to look at things like Marianne Shore being the primary participant in the murder. Having spent two years in pretrial detention, Mel was now a free man. This verdict stunned a lot of people who watched the trial and followed the case. Everyone had an opinion of where the case went wrong. If only they found those photographs. If only Marianne was prepped better. If only the case wasn't moved to a different county. The trial was sent to a nearly all-white county. Mel and Brenda were both white, so it wasn't the defendant and victim that people felt may have been prejudiced against. It was the DA. He was black, and according to sources, he had an oration style that was like a Kentucky preacher. The jury had one black person on it, and he was the lone holdout in the end. He was voting to convict. He eventually changed his vote to not guilty, not because he thought Mel was not guilty, but because 11 people were pressuring him. It's not just because it was a mostly white jury and a black prosecutor that race was brought up. It's actually one of the white jurors who got the conversation going. While complaining about the juror who held deliberations up because he wanted to go with a guilty verdict, this juror referred to him as the colored juror. The word colored in the early 1990s was out of most people's vocabulary. But if this juror was older and he was living in a small county that was still segregated, geographically at least, it may have been a word that was still accepted by his peers. I'm not saying acceptable, just that they accepted it and it was never corrected, so he continued to use that word. But even if we give an allowance for language, the juror brought up the man's race for seemingly no reason. It shouldn't have mattered if the juror who held things up was black or white, unless it did matter, unless race was a factor, possibly an unconscious bias, on the part of at least one juror. Did that bias influence the outcome of the trial? It's a question that has been asked in pretty much every write-up on this case, but we have no answer because 
most of the jurors have not spoken on this case. Among those disappointed in this verdict was the trial judge. He was so convinced of Mel's guilt, he wrote a letter to the family to apologize for the verdict. He said justice would be done in this world or the next. And the authorities decided they would like to see justice done in this world. I don't know if you've spotted how many similarities there are between this case and the episode on Fred Tokar's from a few weeks ago. We're talking about abusive, controlling men with partners who are trying to end the relationship. Even the people who eventually rolled over on Fred and Mel had been brought in for the same charge, passing bad checks. So here's another similarity. The federal government tried to get Mel on something related to the crime so they could charge him even though he had been acquitted in state court. We talked about dual sovereignty and it being the exception to double jeopardy in the tow cars episode. So go listen to that if you haven't yet. But it actually didn't apply here. The murder of Brenda Schaefer was not federal jurisdiction. She had not been taken over state lines. She wasn't killed to cover up for a different federal crime. She wasn't killed on a reservation. None of the things that would typically make a case federal apply here. But what Mel did do was he testified in front of that federal grand jury. Shortly after the acquittal in state court, Mel was charged with federal perjury for three instances of lying to the grand jury, which included the testimony about how Brenda and Marianne had never met. Mel pleaded not guilty to these perjury charges, and he was released on bond. A month after this, Marianne Shore was sentenced to five years in prison. So Marianne testified against Mel, and she went to prison while Mel went home. But life outside of jail was not easy for him. Mel had lost everything financially. He had to sell his house and pretty much everything in it to cover his defense attorney fees. He had spent two years in pretrial detention, which meant he earned no money to recover anything he lost. Mel ended up having to move in with his adult son. The people who had bought Mel's house decided to fix it up, which included tearing out and replacing the carpet. The company showed up on Thursday, October 1st, 1992, to pull out the old carpet. It was a week before Mel's perjury trial was to begin. When they lifted one of the corners, they saw that there was an air vent that had been completely covered by the carpet so that it wasn't visible until the carpet got torn up. Inside the vent was a plastic Ziploc bag, and inside of that bag were three rolls of film, undeveloped, a ring, a necklace, and a tennis bracelet. The worker ripping up the carpet showed the items to the owner, who immediately notified the police. They were aware of who owned the house before them. The jewelry matched what Brenda had with her the day she was going to meet Mel. And the investigators were sure what that film was. They had been told by FBI profilers that what Marianne Shore described was the work of a sexual sadist. If she was telling the truth about the photographs, they still existed somewhere. Mel would not have destroyed them. And here was the film found alongside Brenda's jewelry. Before they even developed the film, they went and arrested Mel. And when they did develop the pictures, they found exactly what Marianne had described. Over 100 vile and disgusting photographs of the abuse and torture of Brenda Schaefer. Also, just like Marianne said, the man in the photograph was only visible from the chest down. Arms, legs, even genitalia could be seen, but not his face. No one, particularly not a man in his 50s, has a flaw-free body. Marks and moles and hair patterns could be matched exactly between the photographs found and pictures they took of Mel after his arrest. These pictures were of him, and they could prove it. 
a guilty man had been set free. The slam dunk evidence had been found, but because of double jeopardy, there was nothing they could do about it other than have more evidence in his perjury case to say that Mel lied when he testified he didn't hurt Brenda. The day after the photographs were found, Mel pleaded guilty to perjury after he struck a very quick plea deal with prosecutors. There were a few reasons the federal prosecutors accepted a plea deal. One was the photographs. If this never went to trial, those pictures would remain in evidence and never be viewed publicly by anyone. They would never have to be turned over to Mel's legal team during discovery. There was no chance Mel Ignato would get to view his trophies, and no chance the family would have to know they were presented publicly to a jury. Another factor was a condition they gave Mel. He had to confess not just to the perjury, but also to the murder. He had to stand up in court and go on record admitting he was guilty. In exchange for this, Mel would be given an 8 to 10 year prison sentence. Mel's admission in court was reported as Mel taking responsibility for what he did. But from where I stand, taking responsibility when you get something out of it, like a reduced prison sentence, isn't the same as taking actual responsibility. Mel said he was wrong and that there were reasons for the horrible things he did, but there were no excuses. And I say he was 50% right. There were no excuses, but there were also no reasons. Not that his attorney didn't try to give some. Mel was under pressure. He was under the influence of drugs and alcohol. And he was dealing with poor health as well as financial issues. And that made Mel just snap. He snapped and then spent weeks meticulously planning the rape, torture, and murder of Brenda Schaefer. And then he spent months covering it up. But yeah, he just snapped. So part of Mel's confession to the court was that he did kill Brenda with chloroform. And then he said, Brenda died peacefully. At this point, Brenda's brother, who knew what Mel had done to his sister, yelled out in court that that was BS. So Mel's plea deal was accepted and he was shipped off to federal prison in Pennsylvania. Meanwhile, Marianne Shore was released from prison three years into her five-year sentence, getting out early due to good behavior. Now, I personally find Marianne to be a question mark in this case. Was she also a victim of Mel's manipulation and controlling ways, or was she an equal and willing participant in the attack on Brenda? Is the answer maybe somewhere in the middle? Maybe I'm thinking to either or here. There is some point she's responsible for what she did. No one disputes that she got off with a lighter charge than she deserved, but it's still up for debate what harsher charge would have been acceptable. At one point, Mel's son said he believed that Marianne was actually the mastermind. Not that he absolves his father in any way. I definitely don't want it to sound like that. But he does truly believe Marianne instigated it. And Mel, whose life was falling apart, did to some degree snap and went along with it. Mel's son actually knew both Marianne and Mel. He's one of the only people who saw their dynamic up close. On the other hand, he's also slightly biased towards his father, having found Marianne to be manipulative and mean to him when he was a child. But I do think his opinion on their dynamic is worth considering. Marianne is no longer here to answer any of our questions. She died in 2004 at the age of 54 from heart issues. Mel ended up only serving five years on the perjury charge, getting credit for time served. When he was released, the state took him to trial again for perjury. The federal grand jury wasn't the only place Mel had testified. You remember when Mel insisted on taking Dr. Spaulding to trial for writing that threatening letter? Mel testified in that case, and in that case, he testified that he didn't kill Brenda. But of course, we know he did. The $300 fine Dr. Spaulding had to pay 
was money well spent because without that case, without Mel testifying and lying under oath in that case, he would have been a free man at this point. Instead, he ended up with state perjury charges and another nine years in that case. Of course, he was paroled early. In December 2006, Mel was released from prison again at the age of 68. He ended up spending somewhere around 10 years total in prison for the various charges. At this point, Mel Ignato was in very bad health. Two years after his release, Mel was living alone in an apartment. His neighbor said he could hear Mel at nights moaning in pain. Then in September of 2008, his son went one day to check on him and found Mel dead. It appeared that Mel, who was reliant on a wheelchair, had fallen and cut himself on a glass coffee table. He then bled to death. Some might see this as some sort of cosmic justice. Because of the perjury charges, Mel did spend most of his life from his arrest for the murder of Brenda Schaefer until his death locked up behind bars. His death would have been painful and scary, just like Brenda's. It even involved a glass coffee table, not unlike the one he tied Brenda to before torturing and murdering her. After his acquittal, the trial judge wrote that justice would be done in this world or the next, and it seems like the universe said all of the above. Thank you for listening. You can find Crime Lines on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Crime Lines is also on YouTube, where I post two to three true crime videos a week, including an occasional after show where we go over any visuals from that week's podcast episode. Crime Lines is also on Patreon, where I offer early and ad-free episodes as well as bonus content. Visit patreon.com slash crimelines. And if you want to buy me a coffee, the official drink of Crime Lines, you can give a one-time donation at basementfortproductions.com slash support. And if you need a palate cleanser after listening to heavier true crime shows, check out Rusty Hinges, an occasionally funny history, mystery, and true crime podcast that I co-created and write for. 